Good evening everybody, it's John here from Tutor to You again, welcoming you along to another of our Revision Blast sessions for A-Level in Economics. Uh, the third in our new series from this uh, academic year. We're going to have a little bit of a break next week, but welcome tonight to those of you who are joining us live. Let me just have a look at the clock. Yes, we've got loads of you here with us here tonight. Uh, welcome you along and please do feel free to join in with the questions as we go through them uh, by using the chat window. If you're joining us uh, using the replay version, welcome to you as well. Hopefully you're going to find the questions and activities that we've got on demand and supply tonight useful and valuable for your revision. Maybe you've got some mocks coming up uh, or you're thinking about your exams a little bit later on in the academic year. Another big welcome, of course, though, to our main presenters tonight. We've got Peter in the middle of the screen and Jeff on the right hand side. Good evening, both. Hello, John. Hello, Jeff. I think you muted, Jeff. You got yourself muted at the minute. Just unmute myself. Yeah, I'm there you go. John, I'm brilliant at the technology. <laughs> You'll know what you're talking about. Uh, well, on the basis that you've unmuted yourself, Jeff, I think we're ready. Shall we get started? Let's crack on. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so we've got we four go. multiple choice questions to start with. As always, if you take a moment to put an answer in the chat window, we'd love to see who can get these answers right. Uh, some tricky ones, actually. Here's the first question. World steel production decreased significantly last year due to falling global demand for steel. The production of aluminium, which is described as a substitute for steel, has become more profitable. So the, the, the diagrams you've got there, A, B, C, and D, they show the global steel market. And the, the question is, which one of these diagrams best shows the effect of these changes in the global steel market? So you've got two changes described in the text. And we're looking for two shifts in, uh, two curve shifts. So the uh, falling global demand for steel and the production of aluminium, which is a substitute for steel, has become more profitable. So what's the likely effect on the global steel market? If you get a chance, post the answers in the uh, the chat window. They're coming through. Uh, we've got an answer coming through. It says C. Gina says C. Uh, and all oh, the answers are coming through quite strongly now. In fact, Cornell says C. A lot of people saying C. Let's check the answer. And it is indeed C. Fall in demand, D1 to D2, that's the fairly straightforward one. But we're told that aluminium is a substitute for steel. If it becomes more profitable, you'd expect a switch in supply away from steel towards aluminium. Producers may be searching for those supernormal profits, so the supply of steel might shift to the left. Great start, Team Economics. Let's try our second question. Four diagrams below, A, B, C, D. Show the market for an ink jet printer. Some of you may know what they used to be. Which of these four diagrams represents the effect of an increase in the price of ink cartridges, which are complements, and an increase in labour productivity in the production of this printer? So again, two changes. It's all about identifying isn't it, the supply and demand shifts here. The effect of an increase in the price of a complement to an inkjet printer and an increase in labor productivity in the production of the printer. What do we think? Answers are gonna come through in a second or two. So we've got two changes, and the key here is what do you think is happening in the market? And uh, what are people saying? D question mark, be quite interesting. Uh, KG says D, Gina says D. Let's try the answer again, please. So it's D, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, let's go through the second one. Higher labour productivity causes a fall in unit costs. So that shifts the supply curve out from S1 to S2. And the cartridges, well, they're a complement to the printer. So if cartridges become more expensive, fewer people will buy the printer, and therefore there's an inward shift of demand from D1 to D2. So the answer is indeed D, and well done to people like Dermot and uh, uh, Gina, who got that right. Question three. Here's the market for record players to play vinyl records. Interestingly, the demand for vinyl records is coming back into fashion. Uh, here's the market. Uh, the price is set higher than the equilibrium at P2 in the diagram below. Now, which of the following is least likely to be one of the consequences of setting a price higher than the equilibrium? Take a moment on this one. There's quite a bit of reading to get through here. So we've set a price initially, P2, which is higher than the market clearing price. And the question is, which of the following is least likely, least likely to be one of the consequences of that? What do we think? 
So let's take a look. Coming, the answers are coming through. Uh, okay, a couple of people saying A, we've got a mix of opinions here, C. Let's go for the answers, please. Correct answer is C. Yeah, if you set the price too high, uh, or an excess supply to a contraction of demand. Oh, sorry, sorry, the right answer here, in fact, should be uh, A. There might have been a little, little error on this question, actually. The right answer should be A. The excess supply from an extension of supply creates a downward pressure on... Oh, no, sorry, that's right. That's right, big problem. Sorry, sorry. Let's get this right. Uh, let's get this right again, please. Uh, yeah, you're setting price at P2, which is above the equilibrium price. Just work through the answer. So the excess supply resulting creates a downward pressure on price. That's correct. But there's excess supply of surplus in the market equal to Q2, Q3. That is correct. The excess supply leads to a contraction of demand. That is, that is the, uh, the correct answer. Uh, so, the, yeah, sorry, that's the least likely to be one of the consequences. Because you have excess supply, then the price will fall towards P1. That will cause an expansion of demand. So the right answer there is, is C. And here's our fourth question. Uh, during the Football World Cup in Qatar, on its way, there was a predicted increase in the demand for football, as shown by the new demand curve D2. At the initial market price of £30, and assuming no other changes, no other shifts in supply and demand, which of these statements most accurately describes both demand and supply? What do we think? for question number four so there's been an outward shift of demand from d1 to d2 at the initial market price of 30 pounds no other changes than at the price of 30 pounds there will be excess demand and as a result you, you end up creating a kind of shortage in the market okay there's our four multiple choice questions let's move on to the next activity with pete Thanks, Jeff. So what we've got here is a 10 second countdown. You can see on screen we've got a number of different uh, products. You're going to be shown a question. And what we want you to do is to put in the chat window. There'll be two goods that are linked together. So if you think that um, goods A and uh, B are related somehow, um, given what the question is, we'd like you to put that into the chat window. So nice and straightforward. We're going to give you 10 seconds to do this. So as quick as we can, let's see what the question is, please, John. So 10 second countdown start from now. Can you find two complementary goods? Answers about to come through quite quickly. Thank you very much. We've got Dean B. F seems to be um, one of the common ones. Let's um let's see what we put. Thank you for the contributions. Really good so, stuff so far. A and F, indeed, the uh, the the car and the petrol pump. Remember, complements are um, two two goods that are going to be bought and used together. It's very unlikely that you are um, going to buy a petrol car and not require um, petrol and diesel from the pumps. Obviously, as, uh, as times change and technology changes and changes in government legislation, we're uh, we're moving away from um, petrol and diesel cars, aren't we? Eventually, to um, electric cars, but. Of course, a lot of that's going to depend on um, changes and developments in infrastructure. Um, so the key here is remembering that with complements, these are goods that are bought and used together. And there's some nice um, theory that we can also build on a link to here with regard to uh, price, sorry, with, with regard to cross price elasticity of demand. Because it's important in your exams that you are aware of what the coefficient for uh, cross price elasticity of demand is and for complements the cross price elasticity of demand is going to be negative. Okay, next question, please. Can you find me two goods with composite demand? Wait a couple more seconds. There's a couple of answers coming through. We've got G and H, C and H with a question mark. Think about what uh, composite demand is. When goods are competing with one another, there's um, a little bit of a hint for you. Let's, uh, let, let's take a look at what we picked out. So we've got two types of cheese there. So um, we've got two different variations. The demand for um, cheese is going to be, 
it could be used for cheese it um milk could be used for cheese it could be used for yogurt it could be used for, for milk and um, the idea with a uh, competitive demand is that the um, good in question is competing with uh, something else with regard to its demand okay let's take a look at our final one our final example here I do apologize if I don't spot something in the chat window. My connection is quite slow here. So can we find two goods with joint supply? So two goods that are supplied at the same time. We had a couple more seconds. I know 10 seconds isn't an awful lot of time. Thank you for the ones that are coming through. Um, H and C seems to be a common answer that's coming through. Thank you to those who've contributed. We'll see if there's any more. Seems to be pretty unanimous. Uh, Jesse coming in there with C and H as well. Let's take a look. Lamb and wool. In fact, when I talked this with my uh, you know, 12s today, that's the exact same answer that I used. If um, we see an increase in supply of lambs, uh, we will also see an increase in supply of wool as well. The two goods are supplied jointly with one another. Okay, I think I'm gonna hand over to Jeff now for the bubble quiz. Yeah, lamb and, lamb and wool. There's no need to be so sheepish about it, Pete. That's a, it's a good example. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Quick, we have, uh, we're going to give you uh, a question, funnily enough, and uh, four possible answers. Now, there could be one correct answer, two, three, four, or all of them could be incorrect. So the challenge with the bubble quiz is to say, well, how many of the following are correct? Here's our first question. For which of these market changes would total revenue increase take a moment on this one plenty of time on the chat window so how many of these answers are correct for which of these market changes would the firm's total revenue increase total revenue of course is the uh the price per unit multiplied by the quantity or the area underneath the, de the demand curve so what do we reckon how many of these answers are correct is it one two three four or none of them Het's gone for A and B. Birdie thinks it's C. Uh, Glace says B and A. And uh, what have we got? A couple of others. Uh, Gina Marie says A. Let's double check the answers. Here it comes. That is A and B. Yes, when demand is price elastic, in other words, a coefficient of greater than one, if the firm lowers the price, you'll get an increase in demand. So, for example, you, if it's if it's minus two, if the coefficient's two, a ten percent fall in price would lead to a twenty percent increase in demand. Revenue goes up, and B is also right. If it's price inelastic, the coefficient is less than one. A good example there: if the firm raises price by let's say twenty twenty percent, that might only see a four percent fall in demand, uh, giving a zero point two coefficient of elasticity. When demand is price inelastic, if you want to raise your revenue, you increase your price. So A and B are the correct answers there. Let's have another go. Uh, don't forget how many answers of these are correct. Which of these is likely to make the price elastic demand of a good X uh, of less than one? So which of these is likely to make the coefficient of price elasticity to be low, below one, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, Price inelastic. Kula Sagaram says A, B, and D. Very quickly in on answers. Give me a few more seconds, see what people think. When will demand be most likely to be price inelastic? So factors causing low price elasticity. By the way, if you're watching on the replay, just pause the video, have a go at the question. Uh, Glaze says A, B, D. Shah Jelani says A. Only ch choose the ones you've got confidence in, and we'll go through the answers with you. Okay. Quince B says A and B. Bertie says A and B. Let's go through the answers. Well done on that one, everybody. A, B, and D were the correct answers. So Kula Sagam got it exactly right, and congratulations. A few close substitutes. That means there's less choice for consumers. Jude came in with A and B, got the first two out, Jude. Uh, so a few close substitutes makes it inelastic. High costs of switching. A lot of people list, uh, miss this out. If, if there's a very high switching cost, it makes people reluctant to change their demand when the price changes. 
things like switching mobile phone contracts, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the other one is uh, high demand for good X during peak periods of the day. When demand is at a peak, peak uh, demand for whatever it is, uh, electricity, for example, uh, the price tends to be demand tends to be priced inelastic. C is wrong. Uh, when the when the price is a big share of your budget, you tend to become a more price sensitive. The price of a package holiday or a new car or perhaps a new smartphone, for example, you tend to be quite sensitive to the price. Here's our next one. Uh, which of these statements are true? OK, which of these statements are true? Interesting question. A little bit to read here. So take a moment on this one. Uh, normal necessities. One on price elasticity of supply, one on inferior goods, and one on substitute goods. So here is our final bubble quiz question. Which of these statements are true? What do we think? Jude's gone for A and B. Uh, just give it a few more moments as these answers come through. Which of these statements are true? Het has C and D. A few more seconds. It's always great when people do answer in the chat window. Um, sure, Jelani's gone for A and B. And Bertie has gone for C and D. Well, let's have a look. Let's have a look at the answers. And the answer is A, C and D. A lot of people said C and D. Uh, well done on that. It's also A. Normal necessity is a product with a low but positive income elasticity of demand. You tend to buy a little bit more when your income goes up, but not a lot more. So A is right. Uh, when elasticity is less than one, uh, it's very difficult for producers to increase supply without a rise in cost. So um, B is incorrect. Inferior goods do have a negative income elasticity of demand. As incomes go up, in real terms, people buy less. And um, people are saying that the, the cross price elasticity of demand for two complements is negative, which is correct. The cross price elasticity of demand for two substitutes is positive. The price of one good goes up, the demand for the other good also goes up. So well done on the bubble quiz. Let's move on to vengeance. Okay, thank you, Jeff. So here you've got 60 seconds to separate these items into those with price inelastic demand and those with price inelastic supply. And of course, where the two circles cross, we want you to put in those the goods that have got both price inelastic demand and price inelastic supply. So what have we got to choose from? We've got cow's milk in the short term, front row, uh, uh, front row tickets to see Harry Styles, a box of matches, gas uh, for households, peak time rail tickets, Diamonds, coffee beans in the short term, and um, there's a question on coffee beans for those uh, for, for Excel students that appeared in last year's paper. Looking at, uh, looking at price changes, and finally we've got cigarettes. So you've got 60 seconds to separate them out, starting from now. So in the chat, if you just want to write sort of price inelastic demand and then put the numbers, that would be absolutely wonderful. Similar for price inelastic supply and those that you think have got both, simply under the label both. Okay, 60 seconds isn't an awful lot of time to have a go at that. So uh, well done if you if you attempted. Um, thank you, uh, Ben there, um, who's come in with um, ped being in elastic three, four, and eight, and uh, pairs of uh, two and six. And now it's we're getting lots more through. So thank you. Yeah, I certainly was one that was enjoying the music as well. A new tune. I hadn't heard that one before, so that's a nice one to be added to the repertoire. Um, uh, Het says for inelastic demand, gas, uh, cigarettes, uh, box of matches and peak um, rail tickets. A few more answers coming through. Let's let's take a look and then we'll 
then, then we'll go to the explanations. So um, those of you who said that a, a box of matches and cigarettes have got price inelastic demand. Let's have a think about why why that might be. Well, it could be for an, a number of different reasons for for a box of matches in terms of the proportion of our income that that takes up a, a change in the price of a box of matches probably won't really affect spending habits that much given um, how much price changes in regard to a consumer's income. Six, well, um, I think the majority of the ones that I saw in the, in the chat window there, um, probably you've been taught this by by your teachers at school. This is a, this is a common example to um, put in the price inelastic demand option, given that um, we know that cigarettes are a habit forming goods, so consumers will resist those price increases and they'll still um, buy cigarettes if they are addicted. Switching over to price inelastic supply, it's really important that you um, th th that you grasp this idea of the short term, you know, thinking about our FOPs, our factors of production, that the definition that many of you are probably being taught in school is that in um, the short term is a, a time period where at least one of the factors of production is fixed. So in, in, in the short term, you, we can't get any more milk. Um, what we're sort of limited if the price of milk goes up, suppliers will be um, you know, quite unresponsive to that price increase. Their change in supply will be less than proportionate to the change in price. Um, and similarly for coffee beans, um, we know that um, the weather, the climate, that impacts um, uh, crop yields. So even if the price of coffee goes up, um, farmers and, and, and producers um, will be really unable to match that price increase. So the increase in um, quantity supply will be less than proportionate to that increase in price. The ones that you could have put um, in the middle of the Venn there is, is gas in terms of uh, households. That's going to have price inelastic demand and price inelastic supply. You know, lots of uh, capacity issues being discussed, particularly on in the news today. I was I was listening on, on my drive home. Uh, front row tickets to see Harry Styles. Well, those people who um, are really big Harry Styles fans, they will probably pay that increased um, price uh, regardless. However, there's only there's only a limited amount of tickets that are available, so um, supply is going to be price inelastic too. The same can be said for diamonds. Of course, they take time to um, to mine and. And extract and from the consumer's point of view um, those consumers that are willing and able to, to buy diamonds they can afford diamonds from their uh, relatively scarce income they will buy them no matter what the price peak time rail tickets same logic really if I need to be in um, London for a 10 o'clock meeting and I'm leaving Newcastle at uh, half past five six o'clock I will um, pay that increased price regardless of um, well, well, regardless of the amount, if it if it's a necessity, if it's part of my job, um, and similarly on the supply side, there are a limited amount of peak time rail tickets available. So, what we were really looking for here, when you were categorising these, is think about different factors that affect PES and PED, and then use that logic to determine whether or not it's price inelastic, or price if if it was price elastic, would give you that option. Um, you need to use the logic either way. So, um, thanks for your contributions, and I'll now hand back over to Jeff for on the flip side. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Front low tickets to see Harry Styles. Well, uh, all I can think of is if I got a ticket, I would hope that the seat didn't face the stage. But that's just me. That's just me. Let's have a good <laughs> on the flip side. What would be the alternative view to the one shown? Little example of, of evaluation coming up here. We're going to show you a, a view, and here it is. Uh, demand and supply analysis has value to firms as it can assist in calculating changes in revenue from a change in price. So that's that's the that's one view. Can we potentially just offer a line of evaluation? What would be a criticism of demand and supply analysis? So here's our first side of the coin. Demand and supply analysis has value to businesses because it can assist in in helping them calculate changes in revenue from a change in price. Can we think of a possible evaluation point to that view? If you're watching on the replay, just press the pause button and maybe have a go at it. We'll, we'll give you a suggested answer in a second or two. So what do we think would be an evaluation for that point? 
few more seconds and then we'll give you a, a possibility. Okay, well, let's have a look at uh, our suggested answer. And here it comes. Uh, demand supply analysis has limited value, as in reality, firms don't know precisely how demand reacts to changes. Oh, yeah, Bertie came in with the assumption of Keller's power bus, uh, is un inaccurate and unrealistic in a real world where components are not held constant. That's a fantastic bit of evaluation. Just a key point about our one there. Um, the key thing here is that the longer a firm is in the market, the greater is the quantity and the quality of the market intelligence they acquire. If you think about businesses like Tesco or Aldi with loyalty cards, often the data given to them by customers using their loyalty cards gives businesses terrific market intelligence and that it helps them essentially estimate their demand curve. Let's try one more. This is quite a really good evaluation. Brilliant. That was a brilliant answer, by the way. So congratulations on that one. Price elasticity of demand analysis has value as it can be used by business to help determine how and if they should use pricing. What might be a criticism of elasticity analysis? Why might you, how might you be able to flip that point and challenge and question the, uh, the, the, uh, the essential argument is that use the value of elasticity of demand to set different prices in different markets otherwise known as price discrimination. Not easy, this one. Uh, Bertie and Gina had some great answers that came through in the live chat for the previous one. Uh, oh, okay, so Gina Marie comes in. It can be difficult and expensive to calculate. In other words, it can be very expensive to get all the data on elasticity of demand, and that takes away some of the, some of the benefit. Excellent point, and uh, let's try ours. Here it comes. Uh, yep, price elasticity. Uh, whoops, uh, can we go back a slide? <laughs> Price elasticity uh, can be criticised as the value of PD values can vary by region. And this is a key point here, though often significant differences or variations in the coefficient of elasticity between regions, between countries, in part because of big, big variations in per capita incomes. You can never quite be sure whether price discrimination that works well in one region of the country or one nation would work equally as well in another part of the country or across national borders. Well done on the flip side. That was some really, there were some really good answers there. Thank you for those. Let's pass on to, to Pete for the last activity. Okay, so here's our final activity. And this is called Missing Link. Now, the whole point of this is to try to get you to develop your chains of reasoning, your chains of analysis when you are writing. So how do we get from A to B? In other words, how can we plug that gap? What is a missing link? So if the price falls for a normal, for a normal good, I think I should say, um, we see an expansion or an extension of demand. Okay, so what would be the missing link between A and B? How do we develop that chain of reasoning? a couple more seconds well what, what we're really looking at here is how could we develop if you were trying in in an exam answer to push up towards those higher levels particularly in the a data response question it was how can we expand that sentence let's uh let's take a look at what we suggested and then we'll have a go at another one and see if um if this helps so um if the price falls for normal good because of the income and substitution effects okay we see an expansion and an extension of demand so there's a few answers just um landed on my screen again i've got a little bit of a slow connection we said uh so het has come in with a quantity demanded increases shah um with a rise in demand I recognise that name from uh, from my class. It's nice to see you there, Shah. And then we've got consumers demand more. Um, yes, we could talk about um, if, if if the question referred to um, mentioned equilibrium and quantity demanded as well. Yeah, they're absolutely two key points that we should be uh, adding in. Excellent stuff. So so we've got, we've got some some smashing ideas. Remember, go back to your one material, and um, at some point you'll have been taught the reason for why a demand curve slopes down, and it's the and it's the basis of the income and uh, substitution effect. So we can use that logic to develop our chain 
of analysis. Let's take a look at and look at another one. So how do we get from A to B? An increase in the use of technology during production will cause an outward shift in a supply curve. So what can we add to that sentence to expand it? I'll give you 10 to 20 seconds. Let's see what we come up with. Can we reach that gap? And again, if you're watching a replay on catch up, what you might want to do is, is pause this now and see how many possibly variations of this you can you can come up with because there's of course a number of different factors. So Birdie's come in with um, because it will increase the quality and the productivity of the factors of production. A nice example that you've given there in terms of uh, new machines and capital. Uh, thanks for that, Bertie. Gina is coming with that it's a cause an increase in labor productivity um, and productive efficiency. What, what what I really like about that answer is how um, you've you've linked in uh, a second concept with um, with this sort of first year. Um, idea this first year topic of supply that's being tested that's um that's really good um het says more output per unit of capital employed so again we, we, we've got some um reference to efficiency being made there that's very good let's take a look at what um what we've put um we've gone down the sort of the, the, the economies of scale route here so that average unit costs decrease meaning a business can supply more at each price in turn this will cause an outward shift in a good supply curve so that's quite a nice way of linking supply and economies of scale and of course if you're in year 12 and you're watching this you, uh, you probably haven't done economies of scale yet but if you're in year 13 go back to your economies of scale notes and your supply notes and, and, and see how you can marry those two topics up let's take a look at question number three so I've got a macro um or something that you might usually come across in um in, in macro studies a fall in the exchange rate it, this could be the pound to dollar exchange rate pound to euro exchange rate okay um a fall in the exchange rate could lead to a decrease in the supply for good why at each price level so think about what might be happening to the price of a, of a, of a component if the exchange rate falls in value or an exchange rate falls in value and this could lead to a decrease in supply of a good at each and every price level Ben swoops in this with this would cause domestic firms to suffer from more expensive imports that is a very good which would decrease the frequency of imports for the firm okay um, but he's added in and a nice contextual example there exports becoming more expensive think of um it's always helpful to think of your spiced and whoopee deck uh, formulas here spiced of course um uh, sorry acronyms spice strong pound imports cheap exports dear um whoopee deck weak pound uh, imports dearer exports cheaper um, and then we've got the price of uh, imports increases relatively. And it's nice to include that, uh, that that relative term. We need to think of it in relative terms in ter uh, with regard to domestic producers or even with regard to um, another foreign producer that we could buy substitutes from. Um, we've got a nice example from Ben there, um, such as raw material imports um, like cocoa and chocolate. So um, what's really impressive there is to see see those contextual links you're being made. Here's the one that we came up with. Um, so you can see that how, how, how close we were. And it's nice to see that some of you have gone down this logic chain. Um, so a fall in the exchange rate, um, as there will be an increase in the price of imported components and raw materials, could lead to a decrease in the supply of um, the good at each and every price level. Because as you picked up on the chat, which is wonderful to see, they are going to be more expensive in relative terms. Wow. Uh, 
brilliant. Uh, with with this, like as I said right at the beginning, with this is our third of this little series, uh, and the quality of some of the answers just gets mm. better and better. Absolutely fantastic. As always, I'll try and do a quick uh, shout out to people who, who responded. Gina Marie, Gina Marie was the first one in Cornell. Kulasagaram, Dermot, Mag, um, Marcus, I think I've got there. Bertie, uh, Glace, Het Patel, uh, KG Sharp. I've got an Akhilms two thousand. I think there. Um, Jude, Jesse, and Ben. Brilliant. Some absolutely fantastic answers. Apologies if I didn't get your name written down uh, and you did respond. Uh, wonderful stuff. Uh, as always, a massive, massive thank you to both Peter and Jeff for, for delivering uh, the session tonight. Uh, a quick reminder that the PowerPoint that we've been using will be available as soon as this session finishes. So if you want to go over some of those questions and have another look, that would be that's absolutely great. And of course, this whole video uh, will be available from the YouTube, uh, the Tutor to YouTube channel, uh, pretty much as soon as, as we've finished as well. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Peter. Uh, wonderful to see you both again uh, hope to see everybody else as well in a couple of weeks time when we return after half term when we'll be back to think about some more macro topics okay good evening everybody take care everybody thanks bye now <laughs>